Hi there, I'm Ishan Mani, president of the I Write Youth Club, and today I am super excited to speak with Miss Laura Record in our latest installment of the I Write Exclusive Author Series. Ms. Record is a card-carrying bookworm, I love that phrase, who manages projects by day, and at night, fueled by European chocolate, she transforms into a writer of young adult science fiction and fantasy novels. Laura grew up in Michigan, but a whirlwind romance after college brought her to Europe, and today she lives in Germany with her husband, two kids, and one fluffy dog. Mm -hmm. um, her debut novel, A Dragon Bird in the Fern, a young adult fantasy murder mystery, starring a dyslexic <laughs> princess, is available right now, and there it is. What a beautiful cover. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I'm so excited for this. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm, I always love to get a chance to talk to people about writing and about books, so it'll be wonderful. And we've had authors from uh, the U.S. and Canada zooming in, but you're going to be our first zooming in from Germany. Ah, oh, right. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm an American, but yes, I moved to Germany um, many years ago, so I've lived here a long time. <laughs> Let's actually open with that then. How uh, have your experiences as an expat, if at all, have they in, uh, you know impacted your writing and your writing style, your writing, your you know your reading, anything? So um, I would say definitely one of the things that always crops up in my writing is communication in some form. I mean, it could be telepathic communication with like dinosaur-like creatures, or it could be something um, like in A Dragon Bird in the Fern, um, where, for example, there's somebody who has to learn a new language and, um, you know, she goes through all the difficulties of of learning that new language and um, also the triumphs when things start to work out. So, um, not, and not only the language, but also in terms of culture. Um, so getting to know a new culture, finding the things in the new culture that you either like or don't. And also, I think one thing that's really important is when you live somewhere else, you get to know your own culture better. You understand your own culture just by seeing some of the differences or similarities or things like that. And so I think you see it in a new light. And um, I think that's something that tends to crop up in, in my writing um, because of having lived here so long. Yeah, I think living in a different place and in a different society kind of gives you a different appreciation for the power of communication and the power of, I think, cultural education. Super cool. Right, right, yes. And and there's so much, so many ways to communicate. It doesn't always have to be with words and, and things like that, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> So um, tell us about your first kind of foray into writing as a child. How did you get into writing um, and how did it impact, you know, what you did in the future, your writings? So I would say I was always a writer, even before I actually wrote on paper um, or on a laptop, of course. Um, what basically would happen is uh, we would have these long car rides when we went camping and they were boring. And so I would spin stories in my head or... I would watch TV and miss the last 10 minutes of a show and I would just write the end in my head. Um, or maybe I would watch a movie and not like the ending of the movie. So I'd rewrite it in my head. And eventually I started writing writing stories down. Um, I think the first bigger thing I wrote that I remember, I was around 12 years old maybe. I wrote a 50 page fanfic science fiction that I was so proud of. It was so long, you know, at 50 pages. <laughs> yeah, and, I think I was um, about that age when I wrote my first long form thing too. My the first thing I remember is a fan fiction of the little engine that could when I was like five or something, <laughs> like oh, illustrated wow. on the side. <laughs> <laughs> but that's really valuable, I think, you know, writing at a, at a young age and how it shapes, uh, you know, how you go forward. And that's so nice. I think it's interesting to consider yourself as a writer even before you know you touch uh, the paper, just by weaving uh, you know stories and car rides and things like that. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's wonderful. And I mean, uh, your, your debut novel is such an interesting concept: uh, a fantasy murder mystery starring a dyslexic princess. Just that <laughs> phrase itself has so much, so much packed inside of it. How did you get the inspiration for that book? And and and. Um, how was writing the, how was that whole writing experience for you so the inspiration for the book it came i would say from two different things um specifically the first thing was i was on a tour somewhere on vacation a castle and i don't even remember it was somewhere in germany and i remember it was out in the middle of nowhere more or less 
Um, and the when we went on the tour, the tour guide told us about the lady of the house hundreds of years ago, who was actually from France, and she spoke a lot of languages and was very well educated, but she didn't speak German. And she unexpectedly had to marry this German man and go to this German castle. Um, and and it really made me wonder, what would it be like to have to marry someone and you couldn't even speak their language and you couldn't understand their language and you moved to that country. And so that's basically how, you know, the, the main character, um, how she came to be, because I started to think in terms of what if questions, what if you were engaged to marry someone and you couldn't understand them and they couldn't understand you either. I mean, it was really in both directions. Um, and then it kind of went on from there. Um, both of my children have dyslexia. So then I started to think, well, what if this person who already had such a tough time, maybe with language in general, you know, what if she had dyslexia? Um, so that made it even harder. Um, and then, you know, what if she had a real need though? You know, it wasn't just, I, you know, I'm supposed to go there, but she really had the burning question yeah. of who yeah. killed her sister. Um, because the problem is if she doesn't figure out who killed her sister, her sister is turning basically into a, a violent ghost who is lashing out at her own family. And if she doesn't figure out who, you know, killed her and kind of bring that person to justice, then her family will get hurt. And so it's it's really urgent for her to also figure out um, this murder with tough, you know, language skills and then having dyslexia. So. <laughs> ah, that's really interesting and I like even there the language element the communication element that you were talking about has kind of been uh, weaved in that's wonderful that's such an interesting concept I mean I'm finding such cool new ideas are circulating now in, in young adult literature especially some really interesting uh, stuff that kind of goes beyond what um, we, we know we might have seen like even five years ago uh, what's on the shelves it's super cool right right there are so many amazing books out there <laughs> Definitely. Um, you know, I, I hesitate to use the word education, but do you think that driving home messages or entertaining the reader is, is more important in writing? So I, I guess I don't necessarily see it, you know, like like you said, I wouldn't really see it as education. I, I don't even know if I would see it as, to some extent, I guess it is driving home a message. Um, and I, I really think that it goes hand in hand. I mean, first of all, yes, I wanted to entertain. That was definitely the thing that I wanted. I wanted to have, you know, to sweep people up into a completely different world and um, show them something that maybe they hadn't seen before or something that, you know, was beautiful and interesting and scary. Um, so I definitely wanted that. But for me, it's also important to create a world either that that shows us that we can fight against things that are a problem or shows that we've already overcome them i want to show that we you know as a world can improve in some way um and i and i think it gives everyone hope also to to read things like that um you know whether it's my main character um jara here who was struggling to learn a language and i mean i know when when i had my children and they were diagnosed with dyslexia there were people who told me will you sp stop speaking english to them so they can concentrate on german only and so that was one thing that i wanted to show is you don't have to there are plenty of dyslexic people all over the world who are multilingual you know and that was something that i wanted to to show there and so that's why i guess i would say i don't think you have to choose between one or the other um I think really having both is is kind of like the ideal, you know, if there's something something positive you can bring across um, and, and illustrate, I think that would be perfect. I love that again, kind of uh, bringing the two together um, is a really interesting mission to have as a, as, a, as a writer, right? In every in every work, equal parts of entertainment. And also I think um, it's not education. I think it would be encouragement almost, or like a sort of an uplifting message. Uh, encouragement, inspiration, some yeah. kind of a, you know, some kind of a feeling that the, sometimes the world can feel hopeless, but I think we can change things. You know, even if we go through dips where things seem like they're going worse for a longer time, we, we can bring it back up again. Um, and I really believe that. 
I see lots of books on the shelf behind you. What's your favorite underappreciated novel of all of all, of all the stuff that you've read? What do you think is one that it's it's really underhyped? Uh, you know, it should get more love than it does. So, I mean, I don't think that I could ever pick one because I, you know, I do love books and I read so many of them. And especially when when you become an author, one of the wonderful things is sometimes people give you books for free so you can read even more than than normal. Um, but one that I would uh, mention is it's called, let me just make sure I get the title exactly right, Between Perfect and Real. It's by um, Ray Stovey. Um, and it's about a transgender boy who is um, basically um, chosen for the starring role in a play um, and um, and all the things that happen and has to do with also coming out as transgender and things like that. And I think, I mean, that's one where I think transgender people right now, they, they're having such a hard time. There are so many people who are trying to either work against them or um, or calling them, you know, terrible things. And it, it's all not true. And this is so, such a wonderful way of getting into the head of a transgender person and to like really learn what their feelings could be, learn what they need. And, you know, that they're real people with ex real feelings and real hopes and dreams and things like that. So um, that, that was one that really stood out for me in the last um, year or so. So Beyond Perfect and Real, Ray Stovey, I highly recommend it. <laughs> Beyond Perfect and Real, great. I'm going to add that to my reading list. The yeah, representation is amazing as well, uh, you know, in all these books. The fact that we're getting all these different perspectives, we're getting, you know, people of, um, you know, from all different walks of life, and we're getting stories about people from all different walks of life um, into the, the mainstream is a, is a really great thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So for you, what has been the hardest part of the writing process? So in any one single book, I would say, um, it's always harder for me to draft than anything. Um, I, I love once I have a draft, I love fleshing it out and adding more emotion and adding more interesting details and maybe a little side quest and all kinds of things like that. But getting the first draft down is it's just a slog. It's just so slow for me. And I really have to force myself. Um, so I actually, I tried this, this current um, work in progress that I have right now. I um, have created a very long outline to see if that would help me. It's something like, I don't even know, 14, 16 pages, a really long outline. Um, so I don't know. I feel like it's a little better maybe, but still I have to You're kind compensating of the plotting part. The, the yeah, the, a lot of, yeah, exactly. I'm trying to get all the plotting part out so that I don't sit there and think, what should happen next? Um, huh. So yeah, that's that's the part that's harder. And, and so now I'm kind of getting all the plot in and I hope that once the plot is in, I can go back there and do all of that, you know, bringing in the thoughts and the feelings and the yeah. all the, the other parts that are more fun for me. So we'll see if that is something that helps. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I know some authors, um, they have like this quota of words they write every single day, um, all that stuff. This is an interesting approach, though, kind of having a lo you know longer, more detailed outline and then going back in and filling in any spots that you have afterwards. That I think that does make getting things down a lot easier. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I'm, I'm a plotter, so I totally get that. I sometimes I'm like, how do you just go in without any kind of a plan? How do you just dive in? What is this? So my first novels that I wrote were actually totally pantsed without any kind of a plot um, beforehand. And and on the one hand, they were really fun to write, but it was kind of like it was because I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't realize what a mess they were until later. And they needed so much revision. I mean, sometimes I had to delete so much and start over. And some people, that's part of their process and they love that. But for me, it just bothered me. I needed more efficiency <laughs> and so yeah. that's why I started really to plot um, a lot and I used to plot just very high level and I knew what would happen in each scene but only you know a sentence from each scene whereas now I try to you know I try to really go through and and detail out even things like important feelings or important conversations and things like that 
so we'll see if that um if that helps <laughs> yeah this is the first time that i'm hearing about it's you're focusing on the drafting process rather than the revision process a lot of authors will be like oh my gosh the revisions but for you it's getting that first draft done which i mean this is the first time i'm like i sympathize with that i get that because <laughs> revision for me is actually easier than just getting the first draft down for me too for me too i mean i usually i i'll you know group i i have a word document where i put in all of the different points that i want to fix and then i group them by topic and then i pick the hardest topics first because they usually are all spread out and i fix those and then the drafting just gets easier and easier as I as I get those big points out of the way. Then I have the little things, and then it gets to be fun, and then it's just line edits, and that's really yeah. fun. So yeah. that's the way it is for me. But everybody's different, you know. Just like you said, some people um, have a word count that they have to hit every day. For me, that doesn't work at all. Some days I don't write at all, and other days I'm I do well and and can write, you know, a couple thousand words. But um, some days are a three hundred word day, and I just have to be happy with that. Yeah. Well, um, just to kind of close off, what's your advice to any up and coming authors, anyone who wants to kind of get their, you know, uh, brain going on a, maybe a first draft or, a, you know, a, a new book that they're thinking about? So I think, I mean, I have a couple of pieces. I think the first one is just read a lot. Um, you're exposed to so much and you kind of soak up some good practices and you, um, yeah, you, you just get to see so, so much and, and it can be very inspiring. Um, after a while, you can start reading and even think about like your favorite books. Why did I like this? Why did this work also, you know, and, and you'll notice, you know, someone does characterization really well or um, a love story came across so well or some, you know, just certain elements where you think, wow, I want to try and do that too. So that would be the first thing. Um, I think the second thing I would say is um, to try not to be afraid of critique, um, because if you if you want to be a serious writer, um, you're definitely going to be getting feedback eventually from agents or editors or something like that. And so um, it's good to kind of start out with with that. Um, I work with critique partners, meaning I read their things, they read mine, um, and then we each tell each other what's working and what's not. And that's so valuable. Um, also, the fact of, that I'm critiquing their work. You learn so much when you analyze someone else's work um, that you can use for yourself later on. So that's also a really valuable thing. Um, I mean, at the same time, you have to also learn which critique points do I want to really act upon and which do I think don't fit? Because people will tell you things, even my critique partners that I really love, sometimes they'll say things and I think that's not what I mean for the story. But a lot of times it just means there's something about that element that isn't working and you have to figure out, okay, how do I fix it? Um, yeah. Maybe not the way they suggested, but maybe it's a different, different thing um, that I would fix. So then I guess the, the last thing um, that I would say is that if things don't work out exactly the way you wanted with, you know, your first or second your work that you're writing on, you know, maybe you tried for a contest or you're, you know, trying to get published, it's not time wasted. Always be working on the next thing. You're always learning from every new project you work on. Um, and it's, it's really positive for your growth as a writer. Um, to just keep working on new things. So um, don't get stuck on any one thing, hoping, you know, this is going to be it and just stick with it. Sometime you have to put it down and say, okay, I'm going to leave that for now, try something new. Um, someday maybe you can bring one of those old things back if it's, you know, the book of your heart or something like that. But yeah, I always think that's a good one. Be working on the next thing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I always kind of keep looking forward, right? Don't don't look back. Um, yeah. And even in the critique groups, I mean, I'm just getting to realize how useful that is because I'm in this um, poetry focus group or like this this workshop type of a thing. It's like 10 other kids across different high school age groups. And I mean, we all just give feedback on each other's poems. We write certain things. And I'm saying even within the you know, week and a half that I've been doing this, I've seen a significant change um, and I see an improvement. Um, in the way that I'm writing and I think a change in the way even others are writing. So it's it's really it is impactful So I, I love all those points that you made. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm glad that it works out I I find it really valuable. I'm always amazed if someone says no, you know, no one should read my work Yeah, I understand the fear behind it But if once you get past that, 
then it's not so bad. Then you just realize it's okay. We're all working to improve the same thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me today, Laura. It's been uh, really a pleasure. Oh, thank you for having me. This was this was fun. Um, and yeah, like, good luck to everyone out there who's writing. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, folks, be sure to check out A Dragon Bird in the Fern. You've heard about what an interesting concept it is. I think it's time for you all to go and buy the book now. I'm Ishan, <laughs> signing off. See you in the next one, and be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Bye.